So yeah, when we discuss materials design in this guy, we often compare finding a needle in a haystack. And of course, in our case, the needle is the best material, the best compound in the space of all the possible ones. And so we are now here today to discuss how we can use ML to help us in this process. But why do we think that we can use ML when people who went into a haystack didn't use ML so far? And I'm trying to answer this question to you today and also show you on the way why I think that LMs can be useful in doing so and hopefully give you some inspiration of what you could do in this hackathon. And to start with, I want to step back and think about how we have been discovering materials in the past. And this has been mostly by just trying things out, just trial and error, brute force, what Edison proposed. But the question, the issue there is that we just have too many things you could try. We are spoiled for choice. So there are different estimates for how large chemical space is. But in any case, it's just too much to try out by brute force. So you might say, Kevin, people found stuff without trying out a lot of different things. So this here is Ira Remsen. And so he went once for lunch break. And then his lunch was sweet for some reason. Then he licked his fingers. His fingers also were sweet. And then he went back to a lab licked all the reagents and vessels, and this is the way he gave us sweeteners. But I think we shouldn't rely on unsafe lab practices or just luck to help us find new materials for our challenges in society. So what do we do now? So luckily, we don't live in a haystack, because in a haystack, we wouldn't learn much by going through a haystack, because there's no structure. So our travel through the haystack doesn't tell us much about where to go next. But we live material space and there's structure in this space. So we can now slowly, with measurement, simulation, and data, build a map of the space and add more and more contour, more and more coverage to this map. And then with models, capture where the interesting parts in the space are to capture what coordinates are interesting for us. And then our models can guide us to interesting parts in this chemical space. The challenge there, however, is that models can learn a lot of different things. So most models can learn almost any function, but want to learn only the right functions are only a small part of all functions. So how do you go from all the functions to the right functions? So if you're Google, you would just use data and throw data at this problem and this way constrain what you can learn with your models. However, in chemistry, data is of course an issue, as we all know. And therefore, we have to incorporate all we know about chemistry and physics into the way we build our model. In the past, we have been doing this mostly by constructing feature vectors. So we have some crystal structures as input, maybe some labels like gas uptake, band gaps, and so on. And then we use a model to correlate um, those, so to correlate a crystal structure with some label. And since you have different number of atoms, different types of atoms, you have to get a fixed length vector in some way. And this is the way uh, you can introduce like all the knowledge you have about chemistry and physics into building the model. So this mapping from crystal structure to this fixed length vector is quite important. It was the main vehicle for a long time to add all we know about chemistry into our models. And so once you have this featureization approach, you can get this for a new material, for a new compound, put this into a model and get a new prediction in this way. And there has been now some tooling out there that helps us in this process, but it's still quite labor intensive and needs a lot of trial and error to find good features for, for a given task at hand. And the interesting thing, I mean, it's helped us across scales. This is now a bit biased to my work, but we could use this approach uh, from the atom scale up to the plant scale, basically, in the end. But interestingly, most data in chemistry isn't in tables, and we usually don't have a nice collection of structures and some labels for those structures. So most data we have in chemistry and physics is in some kind of journals, in books, or lab notebooks, and this isn't structured in a nice way. And, and so how can we leverage, how can we leverage all this knowledge we have out there in books, journals, papers, lab notebooks to help us discover new compounds? And to, to introduce this, I want to uh, go back to a paper that has been published some time ago, but really, I think, sets the stage quite nicely for, for this task. And this is like the most simple thing you could do with language models, and it's about next word prediction. So what you have on your iPhone, let's say, is like a more fancy version of a way 
that given the current context, I can tell you what the most likely next word is. And one way of doing this is that you can train a model, a neural net, that will take an input vector, which in this case is a one hot encoding of some string. In this case, you might have a string for chemical compound or some, some application of this compound. And then the task is to tell what's the most likely next word will be in this context. And so if you have, in this case here, lithium um, cobalt oxide, it's probably used in a battery. And so you have high likelihood for those um, context words. And it's the same for the other compounds. So you produce, you map this one hot encoded vector into likelihoods for context words. And so this group from Berkeley lab, what it did is they mined abstracts from material science and then trained this model, this water wreck model on those abstracts. And an interesting thing is that if you have this hidden space there where you have a vector in two dimensions for each compound, so you map now your, your word into some vector space, you can now look where those compounds cluster and they cluster meaningfully. So you have battery materials, organic compounds cluster close together in this vector space without any labels, just by training on the abstracts. You can even go beyond this and now make predictions. So here you can now ask, what is my vector, my embedding vector for thermoelectric? You get some vector out of this and see now what's closest in a compound space to this vector. And so you then have here this ranking of different compounds. Many of them are known to be good for thermoelectric applications. And then you have this check mark there, but some of them are unknown so far or have been unknown so far for this application. And so there you have this question mark. And then they went out and did some DFT simulations to check those predictions. This is then shown on the right of the histograms. You can compute a power factor that tells you how good those materials are for thermoelectric applications. Larger is better. And you see in here, you have the dashed lines. And for the first predictions they make in this way, without any labels, with just the abstracts, they outperform what has been known so far. So you can just, with this unsupervised learning and abstracts, find new compounds. And this is quite fascinating, also given that now we can introduce much more context in our learning, because often in chemistry, material science, the way you make stuff, the way you make a battery, how you process your polymer is quite important for the properties in the end. And putting this into tables is quite hard because it's so flexible you could do. And having a text interface might be the most promising route to address those things. And then, of course, we also have the recent growth, as Ben said, uh, for LLMs all over the place. And this was then for us a motivation to look into something quite perhaps naive, but very simple, and to just make some questions and answers for different material science and chemistry problems. So we took some data sets, in this case, alloys, where you want to know if they form a single or multiphase. And we can just have this table here, maybe with just those 10 examples, and then form prompts, form questions and completions. And what we then do is we just show those prompts to a model. So we find you in GPT-3 with just those 10 prompts in this case here. And then if we have you now a new alloy, we can just ask the model what the phase will be. And the surprising thing for us was that this works quite well. As so you just take GPT-3, as it was trained by OpenAI, fine-tune with small data sets, and this outperforms all it has been known before. So in this case here, you have the learning curve for those alloys. You have this dashed line, which was a model built by experts in this field with TAUS data points. You have some automated machine learning there in yellow, and you also have CrabNet there. And what you see here is that with just like 50 points, we beat this 1,000 point uh, specialized model in this case here with just this naive approach of fine tuning GPT-3 on compositions. And because we saw that this is like um, so good, we went out to different tasks across chemical space from molecules, materials, and reactions um, for classification regression or the inverse design. That means give me a smile string it has a given property, a given band gap, for instance. And in all cases, we were surprised. So here you have no photo switches, like you want to know when this bond switches between E and Z isomer. 
We now train in different representations like names, smiles, selfies, inti keys. And even with just the name of the compound, you beat existing benchmarks on this task, which was quite surprising to us. And you can even go beyond this uh, and, and try whatever you want. We wrap this into an sklearn-like API, so you can just import um, this classifier was re or regressor, put in a list of text descriptions and labels, and then fit fine-tune the model and then predict later on. And so you have the sklearn-like experience, but without any featureization, any of those hassles that usually come with doing ML for material science. And then you can go beyond um, just predicting um, properties. You can even do inverse design. So here we have again photo switches. And you want to know what the wavelengths are for the different isomers, like for the E and Z isomer, which you have on the two axes. And what we do is we have a database, which is shown here in blue, that has different photo switches in there. And then you want to know how does the model perform if we only train on the ones that absorb below 350 nanometers. So we train only on the green ones. And then we ask the model to go beyond this. And it does so. It can go beyond what it has seen in training and give us a switch that absorb even in the visible regime. And again, this is just this really naive approach of fine tuning this, this large language model on some chemical data. And I mean, what you have seen, what maybe Andrew will also show you, you can even do this with the really large models without even tuning, without even learning anything, without any training, by just doing in context learning. So you just show in the prompt a bunch of examples. So in this case, you might have some Q&A with smiles and, and wavelength. And then you have a question with just the smiles and a missing answer and the model if you use one of the biggest models, so in this case, you look at the Da Vinci models, um, you can also there perform quite well. So without any training, you get predictions that perform like a GPR in this case. And again, this is what we wrapped in a nice interface, in this case with length chain. So if you have a length chain LM, you can just put this in this interface and then get uh, some predictions with just few shot um, classification or regression. Um, I mean, one thing that has been fascinating for a long time for me is that we have this growth in using ML tools in chemistry, materials science, and also physics. So you see here in Ben's plot about the papers. So we have all of those tools, but somehow the bench chemists seem to not use those tools. And I think one of the reasons is that they are just too hard to use in many cases. No one wants to like pull down a GitHub repo and then like install dependencies and whatnot. And so what we have been building and might be an inspiration for you for the hackathon is a, a small tool that can just wrap around different models, different APIs, and where you can then ask different questions and it will then give you predictions directly um, via this natural language input. So you can ask for different spectra properties. It can also do some math new conversion. You can get all of this um, with this LLM plus tools with like the tool form approach. And beyond this, you can now just register your new API endpoint. We have a, a YAML file you can just put in your API um, address. And we could also like have this factory approach if you would like to. But you could also think about what happens if you now have your tool or your instrument um, and, and you have it registered, for instance, on, on Hugging Face or DL Hub. And what you might want to do now is you just can extend our approach and now add interface to the model that you have out there and make it possible to use all the models and by natural language, all the models for chemistry with just a smart input in natural language. Or you might say, I have often different input files or output files produced by my software or instruments. So in this case, you might have an output file from simulation program um, that looks like the one you have here in the input. You want to get out some JSON file, and can you write a parser um, model that writes, a that writes parsers for you, that gives you a Python script that can parse those output files, and can you do this reliably, and how well does it perform? And if you want to do this, there's also a repo on, on Andrew's GitHub, where we have already some parsers within an output files you can try out. And I think that all of this is really what makes the time so fascinating for us for doing chemistry, 
we have tooling that allows us to address different tasks uh, with the same LLM tools. We can incorporate now context into our models. We can incorporate the methods how they produce and process materials and, and molecules. And you can do all of this without any effort. So the, the barriers are really reduced. You can just um, put in your smart string or your names of the compounds, get predictions without any effort. And with this, I want to wish you a lot of fun in this hackathon and I'm looking forward to seeing what you produce. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Um, yeah, I wonder, I think the, the, the new software you showed off was really interesting. I hadn't seen any of that before. So really interesting the way you're starting to package it up in a, a very useful way to, for others. Um, do you have any, any ideas of like fertile spaces where people could explore today? I mean, like there are a few of the ones uh, I've shown, like um, you can um, work on the power source and I started, but didn't have the time to, to work more on. Um, you could also uh, think about extending um, this, this what we call cam chain, incorporate more tools there. But I mean, the many things you can also with paper QA um, uh, or, or beyond this or to automate tools. Um, I mean, there are so many things that we just do all the time that are boring and time consuming. I think the LLMs can really help us there in, in automating this stuff away. 